Hello, and welcome to Unsheathed with your hosts, Kyle Gold and Cam Hirosaki. We hope that you enjoy the program. Please stick around afterwards. There'll be cake and blowjobs. Just thinking, hi, welcome to Unsheet number 52. <laughs> I'm <clears throat> that totally has to be like our outro for I'm, this episode. <laughs> our, it's, it's our stinger, like they have at the end of Mystery Science Theater. I'm funny voice Fox Kyle Gold. I'm Cam Hirasaki, and I have a fox on my chest. I had way too many margaritas, and I'm also I'm Lovejoy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to welcome to Drunk Sheathed. <laughs> um, okay, oh wait, as, as you've as you've as you've heard, we have um, we have a weasel in the house. Lovejoy, as opposed to never mind. Yeah, uh, Love, Lovejoy is joining us. Yeah, we and have mustle at quorum. You can you can tell the mustle has already been at the wine and the margaritas. That wasn't a joke. And the margaritas. Yes, we we started out with margaritas and progressed on to wine. Which is a weird transition for the taste buds. Is it? Yeah, yeah it was. It it's is. An, an odd switch. I, I, now, I, now that we've been on wine for a while, though, it's okay again. I, I went from Diet Coke to Coke Zero, which is not too weird. But. Just blow your mind. You go from aspartame to Splenda. Am I your first weasel? It's not Splenda. It's actually um, a combination of Ace K and uh, aspartame. Oh, okay. Is it? Mm-hmm. Oh, Diet Coke, with, sp- Diet Coke with Splenda is its own thing. Right. Yeah, I don't there's know if no, they still sell no, it. I thought there's no sucralose in Coke Zero. It's all, really? Yeah. It's a combo. They, oh, they did have Diet Coke with Splenda for a while, but I don't yeah. know if they still have it. I haven't uh, seen it in a while because I, I mostly awful. drink... I, yeah, I, mostly, I didn't like it as much. My roommates actually buy a lot of Diet Pepsi lately, but that's fine too. I'm starting to move on to Diet Pepsi. Just I think I'm getting burned out. Our soda machines at work, only the only diet things they have are, are Diet Coke, Coke Zero, and Diet Pepsi. So I'm really burnt out on the diet colas. <laughs> I'm just like I'm dying for like a Sprite Zero or something. But so now I've just been like alternating. They have it on them. JetBlue now. Sprite Zero. Um, I, w- I will say yes, that well, I, since I'm not on JetBlue every day, <laughs> it kind of makes it a little hard to do that. Since you don't commute to Long Beach, you mean? Yeah. Well, um, oh, if only. Long Beach is a great airport. Long Beach is a great airport. Because you get to walk it's out like on the tarmac. The 1950s. Exactly. Wow. Oh, it's Long, so Long great. Beach is one of the few California airports I haven't been to. Oh, it's awesome. It's it's the only airport. There are only like three airports like in the United States where you still walk out on the tarmac because after 9/11 they like San Jose lets you do that. Cut down on that. If you land at Terminal C. Terminal okay. C's gone. Terminal. Yeah, they like they. They've I mean, been phasing them oh, out. Burbank has you go no, out Terminal C is too. gone. It's right. raised to the ground. Yeah. No, Bur- oh, Bur- and yeah. straight up, like, literally gone. Yeah, yeah. literally no, gone. Bur- Burbank has you go out on the tarmac. Uh, they used to. I don't they, know. They, 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 they were as of a year ago. Last August, okay. I was down in Burbank a few times. I'm basing this on trivia when I flew into Kona, because Kona's one of the ones that does it, and they're like, well, this is only one of Wubble Wubble airports. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's because I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm on a rock. There's like... You get out and there's a tarmac and then there's just like lava. So well, like, it's also for places where there's good weather too. Yeah, because you're not going to have like uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. You're not going to walk out on the tarmac. I, I love how you're talking about you're in Hawaii. You're like, oh, I was in the middle of nowhere. Like middle, it's boring. middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. Hawaii doesn't really count. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Although technically, probably it's more true of Hawaii than it is of any of the places Hawaii, that actually claim to be in the middle of nowhere. Like when you look at Hawaii on a map, you f- like realize how in the middle of nowhere. Like it's like how is this the United States? It really is just in the middle of like nothing. Yeah. When I started to lose no, cell really phone is. signals, I was like freaking out because it was like, well, I'm on an island. Like I don't know what I'm gonna do. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> this is not Diet Cola Airport cast. Well, I mean it is now, but we'll try to steer it back. So we released our 50th episode recently. Yes, we did. We had a lot of uh, fun with it. We're very glad that people seem to have enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. It's gotten good responses. Recep- re, uh, reception? Response to the Pyramid Game was very enthusiastic from the listeners, so I'm glad that came across on the audio. All you listeners, if you didn't know what conference was before, I hope you know what it is now for yeah, your seriously. sakes. You call yourselves like furries. If I run into you at a con and you don't know what conference is, I will be very, very disappointed in you on a personal level. And then he'll write a now. story in which bad things happen to you, but not the You're good things. You're a furry journalist. You better know what so, conference is. So, well, also, I'm young. Um, 
But yeah, like as much as I'd love to make fun of the people who were on your podcast, I think I would have gotten that question wrong. I would have had to pass. Would you have known Albany Anthrocon? I so I do know I do know that, but I don't think I would have been able to name it. Uh, which I would have gotten you get Kagi would be very mad at me said, about like, that. Okay, but the capital of New York State. Also, and plus Furcon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, I think one of the things that if we do it again, um, we'll be a little better with the techniques is that you don't have to give clues to the thing as a whole. You can actually give clues to parts of it. So like you could say, okay, first the capital of New York State and then the biggest convention in the United States, which is in Pittsburgh, and then that counts yeah. as long as you just get them to say the word somehow. So like you could have S- – Saying a bird that Welsh people eat apparently doesn't work. What you – yeah, that's the other one. <laughs> Mainly because that clue makes no sense. <laughs> no, that was awful. I was panicking. I had no idea what I was saying. I was very entertaining. I'm and more people- amused by the fact that if, that I said, oh, sir, the architect who built St. Paul's Cathedral, and they was like, oh, yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> um, but uh, That's anyway. really the point of trivia, right? Is that you know random things. You know random things, exactly. But anyway, people have enjoyed it. I wanted to read this one comment that was put up on FA from Fraudus, who we read the letter from. He wrote in and tallied for us all the questions that were answered on the podcast up to episode, I guess, 48, because he hadn't listened to 49. And we thanked him for it. And he wrote, and I'm, for, uh, just for uh, KTEC's benefit, I'm going to read this as written on for Affinity. He writes... I know I've said it once, but I'll say it again. Congrats on 50 episodes of Unsheathed. I enjoy listening to you guys ramble and give good advice. And to answer Hirosaki-san's question of what mindset I was in for listening to 16 hours of podcasts, I was wanting to contribute something interesting to the show, and I thought, why not create a little something to show how many questions were sent in? I was going to add more content to it, but I heard from Kyle on Friday that episode 50 was going to be recorded at RCFM on Saturday. So I had a deadline, and I only got through 10 episodes before I got word. So I cut some of the other bits and just stuck with three things. So with a deadline, Shasta Cola, and a smoothie, I tackled 10 hours of episodes until midnight. Then I woke up, or actually my dog woke me up at 5 a.m., and I remembered I had more episodes to tackle, so I grabbed another soda and some toast. Then by 11 a.m., I raised my paws in the air and said, done! Then I went through, did a quick edit, sent it off, then went to sleep for a few hours. I was determined to get it done, and even though it was long and slightly tedious, I did it! So welcome to so congrats so thanks many thanks to Fraudis it's actually R M F C not R C F M I know that's confusing but hey, at least I'm not on the same weekend anymore yeah seriously so thank you again I'm glad somebody took the time to go through and tally all that and now we can make fun of Condrell for being our most frequent letter writer and also thank him we do not have a letter from Condrell this episode unfortunately yeah and <laughs> he's been slacking off I don't I still need to apologize for accidentally week. making fun of Condrell like three times in as many episodes I know really like I'm I'm I really just said that a, so I a, could give you an opening and do it again. I was going to say, again. as opposed to yeah. Lovejoy, who I have never made fun of on this podcast, ever, ever, no, ever, ever, not once. going to be like, oh, fuck you guys. <laughs> I, was gonna, I certainly never gave you a fake squeaky voice that you yeah. don't actually have. Yeah, which I just don't almost have anyway. <laughs> I'm going to read my email. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am going to read my email. <laughs> Dear Sheathy Ones. I just listened to episode 50. Congrats on making the big 5-0. I don't think we can get sued for that. It's quite an awesome milestone to hit. On the episode, Hirosaki mentioned paying to see you and McGregor kissing a boy. Well, you can. Ooh. I encourage you both to check out Velvet Goldmine. It is a very good movie. I'll leave it up to you to Google it, but it does have a very nice scene of you and making out with Christian Bale. Pretty hot on multiple levels, but especially for the Obi-Wan and Batman fanfics this could inspire. Uh, well, I know what I'm doing after this podcast. I was not even thinking about that, but that's actually ruined it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you back your lightsaber after you <laughs> blow me. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, I know that there's this whole like Batman and Robin mythos, but I I can't I don't see it. Who's on top? Batman. Think oh, so? of Robin or Batman? No, and I mean of this of this Obi Wan. Obi Wan's totally a bottom. Come on, look Is at he? his relationship with Qui Gon Jinn. How does the Force play into this? Um, I'm sorry. Wow, I, I, I'm derailing this podcast. That's, that's Let's fun. finish this email. It, yes. it really takes very little nudging to get <laughs> well, Hirosaki-san to go off into the, Star the, Trek. The, 
<laughs> Star Trek geekery and no, and Star gay Trek? sex. Star Wars. Star Wars. Oh. Star Wars. Well, either one actually, but Star well, Wars more than Trek. And then if you add sort of gay sex slash fic into it, he's, he's just all over. The that. email continues. <laughs> Enjoy pondering that. I think we did. <laughs> Lightsabers and batarangs were not meant to be used in this way. Oh, no. <laughs> Lightsabers that, that, do not work that way. <laughs> <laughs> not only yours, Fuzz Wolf. Of course it's oh, Fuzz Wolf. Who oh, else thank would, you, Fuzz Wolf, for Fuzz Wolf. contributing to us... an episode that we already didn't need help with. <laughs> who else would give a Star Wars Batman slash with uh, lightsaber and bondage implications? Lightsabers. That was like a whole dynamic I wasn't even going into. Speaking of that, remember that drawn together? <laughs> Foxy likes to use a little force. <laughs> uh, Man, all right, you know, then. not enough furries give Foxy Hirosaki love Hirosaki and I can have our own podcast where we just talk about sex and cartoons. <laughs> Strong Xander. Strong Xander. <laughs> all right. Uh, um, thank you, Fuzzwolf. We appreciate it. We um, we do. We're, we're always excited to get a letter from a famous podcaster here. This 2006 bottle of Spanish wine thanks you, too. All right, then. Oh, and thanks. Do I have to thank them all, too? No, I don't know don't. how this works. Oh, well, then never mind. <laughs> thanks, Ants. Thanks. <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Fuzzball. Hi. I was recently listening to some of your back episodes and stumbled upon one that truly tickled my fancy. In episode 21, your read piece is conceived with thought to cadence, pacing, and sound, and I wanted to try my paw at it, so to speak. I've written up a little something, which I'll humbly provide. Whether you'd like to read it is up to you, but I also had a question. Have either of you ever tried to write something that not only sounds good, but makes sense? That is to say, have either of you ever tried to write something akin to a speech, whether for personal or private consumption, or something a little more general? I'll I'm answer, confused. Well, read the passage first, because it's actually, it sounds, it sounds nice, although I, I think I understand his question a little more because I, I think the passage doesn't necessarily make full sense, but maybe it does. Um, so we'll read that first and then we'll answer the question. Slowly wind whispers, sighs soft and sibilant. Muscles twitch along lone body, long and longing. Lonely, yes, yet quiet, content. Quite dark and dull, head stirs and mulls. Chaos at first, spinning brain and numb nerves, willing his mind to slink up through blurs. What wrought I last night? Drifts alone, abated through dim consciousness, fatigue and desire unsated. Dreams spun whole in whorls of errant bliss brought crashing down by reality's fist. Stretching, writing, stumbling, stumped and sedate, writing in black, scrawled, scratched, and stunted. Too drunk to fuck? asks the nebulous note. Nearby, number blacked out in a nimbus of ink, five, 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 something, something. Ah, hell, he thinks. Fur bristling, bridled, a mass rises tall, frustrated and famished, imagination takes hold and lingers along libido. Languid and lazy, lethargic, laconic, roll out of bed, broken bones brought on by bacchic bodiness? Certainly not, no pain, prize self from self-loathing. Up off the floor, shirt donned and undozing. Half dormant, half conscious, and half unaware, leopard lopes low and long, takes flight stair by stair. Hesitating, he waits looks down impatiently, and wills against will for his hardness to abate. Growling, frustrated, and tempted to shirk, the male sighs, sets his shoulders, and sets off to work. It's by Auguste, Musk Ox Par Excellence. That's the second time today the phrase Par Excellence has come up with me. But I'm willing to bet the first time in relation to a musk ox. Yes, that is true. But I'm pleased that he's very good at being a musk ox. There we go. I mean... Because if you were a poor musk ox... They are so few in this fandom as is. That's true. That was that passage was like a little awesome. Yeah, it, it was a little. <laughs> that's a good word. I like. Yeah, I'm, like I'm, bar, I'm borrowing that. Good. You, go, you can have that. And I was gonna say, as as Kyle said, he's not quite sure if it makes sense or not. Well, it makes a lot more sense than uh, Naked Lunch, and people pay money to read that. So that's very true. <laughs> no, I did. You do get a good sense of it from the from the passage. I think what he's asking is. Have you ever tried to write something that with – I mean, his passage has a very poetic feel to it. Yes. In fact, if he broke up the lines, it could be a poem. Actually, yeah, it could. If, if, like, while you were reading it, I was, like, intentionally trying to, like, lose myself in the language, and I think I succeeded, so. I'm, I 
do a verse of Lose Yourself here, but I don't know it well enough. Lose yourself in the music, the moment you own it, you better never let it go. You, you only, only get, get one, one shot, shot you not miss, miss your chance to blow. This, this opportunity comes once in a lifetime. Wow, okay, so if my, like, two bars of Hawaii Five-O didn't get us sued, I hope that busting an M&M doesn't do the same. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, it's very poetic. Um, the language obscures the narrative a little bit. Um, but I think that the ambiguity get, is intentional. Yeah, well, you, it's not ambiguity, really. Well, it's just, the, obs- it's it's flowery language. yeah. But there's enough in there that you get the sense of what's happening. But like, I get like a sense of like aphasia with it, or not. That might just be me. Maybe. Maybe. I so I don't know if it's the wine talking, but I was kind of like writing along with it because I was getting the the feeling of it. I guess I don't know. See, I can't talk about. Writing. Yeah. So the the words the words flow well and each. Or rather, I should say, each sentence or each passage flows pretty well. And I get the idea of what's going on with it, because there's enough in there that you get the the narrative. I, I think what he was asking is, if we ever tried to write something that fit more into a narrative, as opposed to just sort of a demonstration of language. Well, and what's interesting is there's a lot of passages out, or a lot of books out there, a lot of authors that write simply to simply to express language and to play with language and they don't worry about plot and they don't worry about story. So, and I believe, and I've had conversations with people about this, that you don't have to separate the two that you can. And a lot of the time I write story mostly with an eye towards conveying the story and making the story easy for the reader to access and read. But I do at certain points worry and as i'm going through i worry about the sound of what the language is i worry about the sound of the words and and how it's said and especially when it comes to important things like the first lines of a book or the last lines of a book um i pay special attention to those and i often edit those a lot just to make sure they sound right because those are the things that people are going to remember and that people are going to repeat to themselves and i want to make sure they sound good because if they don't sound good people aren't going to remember them as well yeah, like one of my most important editor people that I send folk uh, send my works to out of all the people I send them to. Uh, he's not a writer, uh, although he does have very good writing advice. But he's mostly an artist, and he's very good at finding like spots where just like the language just doesn't sound right. Like he'll say like, "All right, like this is a grammatically correct." But something about the word choice here, just like it, just sounds wrong, mm-hmm. and that's that's feedback that I don't get from anyone else that I send my stuff to. Which doesn't mean that the people, other people I send it to, aren't giving good feedback because they are. Um, but he has a unique perspective on it, and it's sort of like you know this kind of like the aesthetic of what's actually on the page, and he's really good at picking that out. And that's specifically why I always make sure that with my you know, more important works that he gets a look at them. And that's something that you get from reading aloud. Yeah. If you actually mm-hmm. read your work aloud, because I've, um, I've read works aloud to Kit from time to time. And I always make little notes when I do that of things that I didn't notice when I was just writing them in my head. There have been times when I've taken things to conventions to read and, I make little notes as I'm reading because as I'm reading it, I'm changing it in my head because it doesn't sound right as I'm reading it, but it was fine when I was just looking at it on the page. And you get that, um, I dealt with that a lot as copy editing for newspaper articles, and you'll mm-hmm. kind of notice that in, in if you read newspapers, which you all should, I hope. Um, I, is I that just you, read them online. I just read blogs online. Um, um, well, t- 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 like 20- online is fine, but not blogs. I was going to say, 20 years from now, people blogs. are going to come up to you and be like, Mr. Lovejoy, what were newspapers? Yeah, tell exactly. us, about, tell uh, us about the written word, Mr. Lovejoy. So I like pretend like I like newspapers, but I actively did not get into newspapers because I was like, fuck that, it's dying. But, um, but you get that is that because they have to write, they write in a very specific kind of way. And a lot of times you'll end up with sentences that, like, you read them and they're fine grammatically and they just, if you're reading it aloud, you're like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense right. at all. And that's kind of like, 
the copy editor's job basically because you've tried you've trained them all to know the grammar rules like if anybody comes up to you with grammar problems like they're like you fire them immediately so so it's basically right. all about having it sound not dumb and the, the kind of the flip side of that is something that i find in a lot of first drafts is that i'll toss things and phrases into sentences that sound good but that don't mean anything in the context of the sentence so there's lots of phrases that we just kind of toss in i think i've used this one in the past the whole like oh i had no idea how i'd gotten myself into this predicament and that's sort of a stock phrase for i don't know what to do next but if you examine it it's sort of like well unless you've been suffering from memory lapses or you've just woken up and like your house is on fire or something then you're like i have no idea how i got myself into this predicament <laughs> missing real house on yeah. fire <laughs> <laughs> but um but for the most part if it's something like well i was you know i was blah 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 i had no idea how i got myself into this predicament well that's stupid because of course you know how yeah um but it's one of those kind of placeholder phrases that sounds good and doesn't actually mean anything or doesn't mean the right thing in that context. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. I need to I mean, there, there are, there are it, times when like you'll be in a situation like in real life and you're just like, Oh my God. And you're sort of like thinking about like what dumb things you've done that have led to this coming up. But when you think about it, you obviously know, but it's just sort of like, ah, oh. and then you start like, um, the, the term that was coined at furry fiesta earlier this year was regretrospect. Nice. Which I, I really like. So so for that, like, I mean, it really depends on what kind of, like, tense you have your story in, but, like, instead of saying, I don't know how I got into this situation, a lot of times you can replace it with, how did I get in this situation, which then leads into your retrospect yeah. kind of paragraph. Right. And I'm like I said, I need a better... Uh, I didn't mean to focus on that example specifically. Right. I'm just using that phrase well, as example. an example. And how you have to examine it and say, what do these words actually mean? Because you skim over the phrase because it's something that we all yeah, it's a, it's a stock right. phrase now. So yeah. I didn't want to delve too deeply into how do we fix that specific example. I wanted to just say, you know, think about it, go on and edit your text. But for and, everyone who has that phrase in their books, right now they know how to fix it. Yes, take it out unless it's already been published. Oh no! <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we're going to have Lovejoy read a letter. This all right. Is, all this right. is uh, actually sort of an amalgamation of two letters that this, that uh, Sai the Cheetah sent in because we wanted to get pieces of both of them read, and they both talked about the editing work he's doing with Candrel. So I sort of combined. Frankensteined it. Uh, yeah. I, Double I totally, letter. I totally all the Franken way. I Frankensteined <laughs> that. Double email all the way. <laughs> what does this mean? Okay. Hey, Unsheathers. It's quite odd that you would scrutinize Candrel the way you did, more so for the fact that he has been scrutinizing my own works in a very similar fashion. However, he has done it to the point that he has made me throw everything I had for my novel out the window and begin to write again. I've been getting better at details, which was very much needed, and I must say that while it's nice to see my improvement, I feel that it is a difficult and long process. I have stopped working on the novel, shelved it if you will, I will not, in order to write a short story that is specifically there to help practice adding more details and allowing the readers to get in more, sorry, get more in touch with the characters involved, even though the short story is simply smut that was written for the sake of being smut. My question for you is this. How did you get better at writing such details that allowed you to engulf the readers into the characters? My second question is actually more about your podcast than it is about writing. I, myself, as opposed to I, another person, <laughs> have started my own podcast called Be Furry nice. View. Sorry. Where I go and interview different people in the furry fandom to help them seem more relatable as people. So far, I've interviewed Arthur Husky, who is awesome and cute, the creator of Fur Piled. Well, that's the wine talking, folks. Yeah, sorry. That's <laughs> These are my asides. Rad Moose, a wise father within the community. Dilf. And Lovejoy, <laughs> oh, <laughs> this guy, a weasel reporter who definitely knows how to weasel information out of people, which is, uh, ooh. anyway, 
<laughs> My question is There's this. There's a reason I asked you to read this letter. <laughs> How did you get people to start listening to your podcast? My goal for this podcast is to help lesser-known furries. I'm a lesser-known furry? Become better known for their artistic abilities, whether it be art, writing, or music. Any suggestion for you from you or your listeners would be appreciated. Well, apparently I'm a lesser-known furry, too, because he's asked me to be interviewed on his podcast. And love so. you don't do art, writing, or music. <laughs> no, nothing I do is artistic. I'm looking forward to getting Summer Hill and the Out of Position 2 novel where, whenever they are released, and I hope that I can have as much success as the two of you someday as well. Thanks, Jay Hopkins, a.k.a. Cy the Lap Nuzzle Virgin. So you can tell this is an old letter. Because <laughs> he's no longer Lap Nuzzle Virgin. I'll just say that. Oh. And- <laughs> I, I'm going to say... That's not an O, oh, that's a congratulations, Sot. <laughs> <laughs> so, with regards to Summerhill, I will say that some headway has been made as to what's going to happen to that. Uh, I still can't say anything definite. I still can't say, yes, it will be published, but there are, you know, the the the, the foundation is being set for something and I am very much still working on it and it is very much still a colossal pain in the ass which segues into your first question about you know where you say here you know it's nice that you see improvement but it is a difficult and long process yes writing is a difficult and long process you have learned well Padawan that is your first lesson That that is that is probably your most important lesson is that writing is a long and difficult process even if you're saying, oh, I'm going to write smut for the sake of smut, if you're going to write well, it is still work. It will still take effort. And it looks like you're able to scrutinize yourself at this point and see where you're lacking, which is a very important step. That's a, that's a big milestone, being able to look at your own work and see where there are faults. And I think what really helps with that is working to critique other people's work as well. Um Kudos to Condrol for helping you out to that get to that point where you can say, you know, I need to start over again because that's a difficult decision to make. And uh, it's good that you're working with someone who can point out these things and let you know where you need to improve and just say, look, it's not worth it to try to fix what you got. You just got to put it aside and start from start from scratch. Which isn't to say, like, oh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, your idea might still have merit. And, you know, don't just say that, like, oh, nothing you've done is worth it. Because, you know, you still you, you still sort of got to stretch your, you know, your, your, your wordsmithing muscles, so to speak, you know, in putting those words down in the first place. And hopefully that will make your second go around a bit better. Uh, yeah, I definitely think so. The uh, The whole thing about writing a short story to practice adding details and allow the reader to get in touch with the characters is a great exercise and something that I'm doing right now for my next project while I'm yeah. editing the current one. And something that a couple of friends of mine are also doing with their projects of their own. So it's... For some reason, a lot of people seem to be doing it right now, and I don't. We didn't like have a big discussion about how it was a good thing to do. It's just we all sort of came across it and started doing it independently. So, I think it's interesting that he says that he's writing this so that the readers can identify with the characters, and then says, "Oh, it's just smut for the sake of smut," which I think is maybe him being modest or perhaps just selling himself short. No, my my guess is that it, he came up with the idea just to be smut, and then decided to try to actually flesh out the characters a little better. In order you know, to try makes to get it more than them. just smut. I mean, it can still be well. That's why he says even adult. though. Oh yeah. Have I have a question? Have either of you done that? Have you like started with something that's just like really limited to smut, and then like expanded it into yes, even just like a short story yeah. that's like more all fresh out? the time. Every time I, I talk about this on the podcast a lot, it's like, hey, I sat down to write like a quick little story that was just about sex, and now it's a fifteen thousand word character study. That pisses me off so much about myself. Yeah, but, you know, it's a good problem to have. It is a good problem to have. And I think the stories that have come out of that have been pretty good, except for a couple that I wrote and just went, wow, that idea really didn't go as far as I thought it would. This dance club story is (laughs) awful. I haven't written a dance club story in the last... High school gym locker room. 
I don't think I read. I have never read. I have never written a story that takes place in high school. That's the uh, that's the cliche smut for the sake of smut stories. Oh school. yeah, it was high school. High school gym oh, locker yeah. It's because well, the, it's the place where absolutely none of us got laid. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, like right. I've written like dance clubs. I've written multiple dance club stories, really. And you've written dance club multiple stories. <laughs> Well, like, is this Sybil? What are you talking about? <laughs> don't give me the what is this. I don't even about your yeah. uh, oh, I do multiple even. partner dance club stories. So, um, not to, I always feel like I, I have these weird like anecdotes that don't actually match with what these people are asking. Is that um things like shelving novels is kind of this interesting idea to me because I don't get that luxury. Like, if I have to write something like professionally and it's not working for me, and I have to start over, I don't get to, like, shelve the idea and move on to something else. It's like, I have to write about this subject. So it's like, if it's not working, I just have to, like, reevaluate it, like, today, and, and do it. And so it's kind of a... I always find it interesting how people... Well, how other people enough, kind of, like, go back to these things. A lot of A lot of writers, like, especially a lot of science fiction writers from the... 60s, 70s, uh, even up into the 80s, started as copy editors or started working in newsrooms and journalism and talk right, about yeah. how that was a great learning experience for them because you don't have the option of not writing. You right. have to get something done and you have to get it done by this time. You have a deadline and the deadline is not two months away. The deadline is 4 p.m., the deadline is right. 3 a.m. You know, the deadline is whatever, and you have to get it done, and you have to get it out the door. And so once you train yourself to get past this whole, oh, I don't feel like writing it. Oh, the words aren't coming. Oh, I can't get the ideas to work. Then you can um, – it it makes it, it – it basically, it's just what we're talking about. You get into the habit of writing. Right. And you, you get, get, into the you habit get over of it, it and you do it. Who was it who said necessity is a mother invention? Was that Edison? No, that's an old, old one. I don't know who said it first. Um, Google that. We I will. I will check that right now. But yeah, it's it's a but yeah, that's a interesting. Like I always appreciate people because there are a lot of writers on Twitter and they'll they'll post their words for the day, and it's always awesome for them. But every time I do that, like every time they do that, I've written more words that day. Not because it was an awesome furry story that I'm really excited about, was because I had to, and it was right. this thing that I had to write. And most of the time, I don't care about it at all. And we kind of had this thing, like in our work, that that you you write the articles you don't want to do, so that you get to write the articles you want. Because you really have to work up to this like stage where you are trusted enough to write like the the awesome fun investigative things or the cool right, feature right. things and stuff and so it's like it's a lot of work and I don't know if that's really something advice to people who are trying to get their writing thing done but something you know if it if it's something it's my motivation personally like if I don't write I get fired so and that is really the only thing that has motivated me to write every yeah, day and, um Cassie Clare, who wrote City of Glass, The City of Bones, The Mortal Instruments Trilogy, has been has asked a lot, how do you write? And she sets herself a word count every day. Mm. And she basically writes until she meets that word count. And then, you know, she has to meet that word count. And that's one way of doing it. When I'm writing novels, sometimes if I'm doing the thousand words a day novel, that's my deadline for the day. And I have to get those thousand words done. Sometimes I don't. And, uh, but, you know, in, in the... Uh, Modern Writers Workshop by Stephen Cook that we have recommended a few times in this podcast. Uh, it's mentioned that you know that is a a valid writing technique for some people, and, they, and you know it doesn't work for everyone. I don't think it works for me. I sort of I look at my word production count for the day and determine whether or not it was a good day or a bad day based on how much I wrote. But that's not how I you know, stringently, you know, measure myself specifically because I'm just doing this in my, in my free time and not for a living. Unlike some people. Have you tried setting yourself a word count goal? <sighs> not lately, but I've had other concerns. So, I mean, ever, uh, ever. Yeah. I mean, I used to make myself is like, okay, 
if it's a writing day, I'm going to do at least a thousand words. Okay. I haven't done that in a while, though. I mean, a thousand words is a good is good for a day. I mean, yeah, it's solid. And I mean, like, it doesn't have to be. I think people forget the editing process. I think people will try to like set themselves that goal, and will start to write and be like, "Oh, this isn't good," and they'll start to like delete stuff. Don't do that. Yeah. Like, keep going, and then like later in your process, like if it's not good, take it out. That's fine. But like, you need to get that stuff down. Yeah. Like, and that's the other thing. Like when I'm in the first draft stage, it's just get the words out. Yeah. And so now it's tough because I can say I can't set myself a word count goal because what I'm doing is going through and editing. So I'm going through one page at a time which is a whole different yeah it's a horse of a different color yeah and i could say you know i need to get through x number of pages of editing but like i I wrote on live journal today about how i spent half an hour going over like one page of description Mm -hmm. i spent an hour or more on one conversation and then there are times when i'll just sort of skim through the text or i'll read through it and it doesn't need much tweaking so yeah the the last time i worked on Summerhill, i spent the whole evening just working on one conversation because i was trying to make it very particular and it's basically oh how can this one conversation fix all the problems with this whole chapter from the last two times i wrote this chapter and looking back on it now i'm still not sure i did it right so i'll have to go back and do some more yay wow that's part of why writing is a difficult and long process also i did a. Uh, spend some time on the uh the smartphone here apparently the necessity is the mother of invention can uh be traced as far back as plato who is slightly earlier than thomas edison yes just a little bit just a skosh is it confirmed that it's him or is it like an apocryphal quote uh apparently it comes from the republic okay um so about the podcast question uh, I have no idea how we got people to start listening to the podcast. We just started <laughs> recording it and put it out there, and people started listening to it. And then not cast told people about us. Yeah, maybe that was it. Once again, thanks, Fuzzwolf. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Well, how did you start advertising it? Because it took you a few episodes before you got a fur affinity account for it. We both have. Were you live always doing accounts? RSS feeds? Yeah, you did. Live yeah. Journal, and right? we basically said, "Hey, we have a podcast." Yep. And people wrote in. So, so it kind of helped that you guys are already mildly famous. We're, we're fur famous. You're fur famous. I will, I will err on the. Fur. I will, er, no, I will err not. on the Sorry. mild side of mildly. In my case, I would wager that like ninety plus percent of the people who listen to the podcast find it through Kyle as opposed to through me. I will say that there are a lot of furry podcasts out there. So really, there are there are a lot more. I, I than would say I would, have I would say of. find a niche, but like furry is the niche, so that's kind of really well, then hard. Fur, furry writing. Well, then there's is a niche within, within a niche, right? So you guys kind of so got that. The, uh, so is the Hoofers. Who? Yeah, exactly. Like, Hoofers has has that going for them. That's the Doctor Who podcast, and then but they can also advertise their podcast. But, you know, I I'd, I'd right, say the right. same thing that I say about writing. As I, I mean about the podcast, as I say about writing, which is just make the best thing you can. Be proud of it and, you know, keep doing it for the love of doing it. Keep getting yeah. better. Keep learning and, you know, quality will out. That's why I do it. Nobody pays me to sit here in front of a microphone every week. No, we just give you wine. I yes. Would, I would love And it's good wine because Kit has a good wine cellar yeah, or co- wine closet. Kit's wine is awesome. It's all <laughs> that – every time he's like, here's some wine, I'm like, this is great. What is this? And he's like, something you can't afford. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> is this Crane Lake? And he's like, no, get out. Dude, is this Blue Nun? <laughs> but um, I, will, I will say that, like, so I will. What's the word? Thunderbird. <laughs> nice. It's a 2009 Thunderbird. Oh. Well aged. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> Have I ever told you about Frampane? No. no. What? <laughs> Maybe we'll save that for after yeah, the we podcast. Can, we can save Frampane. You have a letter Google to read. It. You have a letter to read. <laughs> LMGTFY. Back go. on subject. Last point. I would I would love to see like a furry NPR like This American Life. Oh yeah. Like where they and this, I mean this is probably way too much work for the fan. Maybe I should just do this myself. Um, but something where they're really like actually doing like these multimedia like projects like. See the fandom 
which you could do at like cons because you you're totally there could. with the people. Well, totally, well, like yeah, you could you easily do it. Find, I mean, there's tons of interesting so you stories. Get the, just you in get the, the fan quotes end. from them. You get these audio things from them, and you really like do that work to make to find the stories and really like present them. Like not as just this like one on one interview, which is basically what all podcasts basically are. But like something like that, I think would be a niche that is not filled and would and could be really interesting and really cool. I think that's something that people should try to do. I was going to say, if Notcast has taught me anything, it's that we are a fandom full of people with interesting stories to tell. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And uh, This American Life, one of the things that they say on their podcast is that they have to narrow down. They do um, like 50 stories a year, or maybe fewer than that, because they've been off for about a month now. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard anything from them, but... Um, they have to go through like hundreds of stories. They pitch like what 10 or 20 a week just to get down to the one or two that they can actually use. Yeah, they do. They do the full interviews for stories that just never make the air, Yeah, which is something you learn in journalism too. You'll yeah. I've, I've written entire stories, like thousand word features interviewing people that just never got published and there's just nothing you can do. And then they stop, like you get this point, it's no longer timely, right? And it's gone. It's gone forever. There's nothing you can ever do with that story again. And that actually sucks more for the person you interviewed more than anything because I'm used to it. But like you tell that, like you've gone to this person, you're like, I'm going to interview you. You're going to be in the newspaper or you're going to be on this like radio show, and then they're not. And like, it's your job to kind of be like, yeah, sorry, my editor shot it down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Y- yesterday's headlines, you kids. Sorry. You weren't quite interesting enough. <laughs> So it's always a bummer. All right. Well, cool. I, I, yeah, I think that's a good idea if someone had the time to put it together. You know, yeah, be a lot that's probably why all the published articles about the furry fandom are the weird sensationalist shit. Yes, I'm sure people I, wrote like, I know normal for articles f- about it that never went anywhere. I know for a fact that if you write a story about furries and it's not at least 52% about sex, your editor will reject it and hand it back to you and tell you to spice it up. BT dub make this merpurient. Yes. Go on with your letter. <laughs> I don't like being rejected by my own co host. It makes me feel sad. Hello, Mr. Hirosaki and Mr. Gold. I must congratulate you for a wonderful podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you. Which I am happy to listen to and take much needed advice from my own endeavors in writing. I am a regular listener, and you, along with Notcast, keep me going throughout my workday. I have a few questions for you, and I hope you can answer them for me. What moods do you really like to write in? It always seems to me that I write things that I really like in the end when I am sad or depressed. It's kind of funny, actually, because it's usually more happy and upbeat things, and I can't seem to stay focused when I am happy. My second question, turn problem, is kind of interesting. My writing usually doesn't last for very long. What I mean by that is that I try to make my story's plotline stay open in case I want to dust off an old piece and write a sequel or add another chapter to it, but I can never seem to want to pick it up again. I I always think of baseball players. (laughs) I always end up coming up with something new and writing maybe a short bit about the idea sporadically and then sitting down and hammering out a good two or three pages. Does this ever happen to you? And if so, can you ever turn a short story into something longer over a period of time? Yes. Yes. My final... Yeah, that's for both of us. My final question is probably the easiest to answer, and I was wondering if you ever sit someplace and think, or act out the scenes you write in your head before you write them. Sit someplace and think? Never. <laughs> Do you act out your scenes? Hold on, let's finish. I want to this. <laughs> I'm always laying in bed just before I drift off and go to sleep. I usually end up acting them out quickly and jotting them down before I doze off for the night. <laughs> Sorry. Again, Sorry, no, think of baseball players. <laughs> Locker rooms. <laughs> Sorry for this email turning into somewhat of a wall of text. Oh, not even close. You weren't even half a page. And I'm looking forward to your answers to my questions from Damien Fox. Thank you, Damien Fox. On the subject of him really writing when he's sad and depressed and writes happy and upbeat things. I write when I'm happy and upbeat and I write sad and depressing things. So we're kind of the antithesis of each other. Yeah, I don't really have a 
specific mood that I write yeah. best in. I, I will just, say whenever if, I have to sit down, I just lose myself in the story. Yeah, I, I, I will say when I'm sad. No, or, no. I, damn, I'm sorry. I was gonna say when I'm sad and depressed, I'm not really motivated to do anything, including writing. Yeah, I think when I'm sad and depressed, I kind of view it as an escape. I'm like, okay, if I, if I, if I'm <laughs> when you're sad and depressed, I'm, you go when to I'm sad and depressed and Kit's not around. <clears throat> I uh, I use it, and I I think well, you know, if I'm writing the stories, and I don't have to think about uh, whatever I'm sad and depressed about. But you know, that hasn't happened since I've been and dating then Kit. Then the lonely so I fox really went home and wished that there was this handsome white wolf to keep him company, but there wasn't. I got my wish. Um, when I'm sad and depressed, I go on a furry mac and I make people cry. <laughs> well, that's because that's because you're a mean weasel. I am really mean. <laughs> Well, you know um, me. I like to call a spade a c- <laughs> <laughs> Is this from your vagina monologues? No, that's from... That no. sounds like it's the unedited Mongrels. <laughs> yes. Which I did not see unbleeped, sadly. I have not seen it. I don't think you're allowed to say that word on British TV, unbleeped. I don't think you're allowed to say that word on any TV, unbleeped. <laughs> I, I, I know it's never what, say that word, period. I was it's say, an awful oh, word. Oh, like, <laughs> yeah, Kit, can you bleep that out of this episode? <laughs> Please, just do it. I mean, seriously. Did you just call God a <laughs> Anyway, I, we talked last week about the whole, like, getting bored with your stories and not being able to finish them, and I don't have a whole lot to add to that it happens sometimes but yeah i mean sometimes you know the momentum dies like in a relationship wait no that's not what i mean at all (laughs) i don't know that's exactly what you mean maybe but we have we have turned short stories into longer stories if you look at my there's a little thing you might have heard of called out of position out of position waterways uh well that wasn't a short story but it was a it wasn't a novel at first. Um, it became. It a wasn't novel. a novella either. I think it was. Te- I think Aquifers is technically still a short story. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was like thirty, thirty-five, something like that. Was it, was it that long? Yeah. Then it, it was a novella. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Streams was like fifty or sixty. I think. I remember streams being really long. I don't remember Aquifers being thirty-five. Yeah, Aquifers was long. It was a long story. Huh. I guess that's a testament to uh, how smoothly it read that it didn't feel that long. Yeah, didn't didn't feel like one of Condrell's letters is what you're saying? Oh no, you're not you're not doing this to me. <laughs> Sorry, Condrell, I was using you as an example, trying to get Hirosaki. To I'm say sticking up for your honor, Condrell. I am um, your I am your knight in slippery armor. Did I ever tell you uh, how I bought That's Waterways, I which was my uh, first novel of yours? No, I was at Comic Con. I didn't know who you were. <laughs> Uh-huh. And um and I went up to Cooner and I was like, Oh, well like what things have you done? And he's like, Oh Buffalo Wings and I'm like, You know I have Buffalo Wings. And he's like, I did all the illustrations for Waterways. I was like, Fine, I'll take that And he was like, If you wait around, like the author's here, he'll probably sign it for you if you want to like talk to him and i was like whatever dude i'm not gonna read it i'm just buying it because you did the illustrations <laughs> i bought it and then on the plane ride back i started to read it and was like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> this is not awful so we we actually got an email which uh we didn't read this episode but we may read it in a future one from a fan in australia whose very catholic mother found his copy of waterways and Apparently stayed up till three AM reading it to finish it. Super oh god, awesome. this that that email like I didn't know whether to feel good or bad for the person who wrote in. Uh, it turned out good. So now it, I feel it, now I feel like we've spoiled it. Like say, I've, I've spoiled it. Could have been email. worse. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, for writing in. We'll read the whole email at some point in the future. We're going to do a whole Australia episode, I think, because we got like two or three emails from Australian listeners. Oh, okay. Oh. So hey, if there's any other Australian listeners out there, send in emails. Or well, no, we're 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 talking to the folks at Midfur to, to see if we can get to see if we can get invitations down to Midfur for uh, 2012. Can or get, furry down under. Can we get Yvonne Strahovski on our show? I who, don't what? know who that is. She's an Australian model. I'm sure there's a lot of Aren't Australian you go, like, people with, like, who'd be happy Tim to be Minchin, on our show. Tim Minchin, the like funny Australian musician. Because I was trying to think of people Australian people would know. How about Ben Lee? No, nobody. Sorry. <laughs> ben Lee is an Australian musician who... Apparently uh, there are no Australian people famous in the United States since, like, Yahoo Serious 
fell out of I'm just thinking Hugh Jackman. Line. I'm just thinking he's not Australian. <laughs> he's super Australian. What are you yeah. talking about? Well, I mean, okay, he's Australian, <laughs> but he's not famous for being Australian. Like he's not a, a famous Australian. He's a famous actor in American uh, movies. I, but he gets his, started his, as doing the Australian like re, like cast of musicals, and then went to X Men. So when people were like, when he got cast as Wolverine, people said, "This Australian, like the Australian version of Broadway, this guy is new Wolverine." Everybody I, went, I, I will everybody back went, up Hugh like, Jackman's Australianness. He's it, super it was no, I believe the Australianness. I'm, Did I'm, you see? Australia? I, movie, yeah. Nicole Kidman was in Australia. She's not Australian. She's New Zealand. That's like the same fucking thing. Who cares? <laughs> oh, now we're going to get lost. Sorry, Kiwis. You're the same <laughs> thing. If that was, if, all right. All well, you NZs. You, all, you, all, you, all, you, all you Kiwis and Australians right in. Right into the show. I was just thinking of the New Zealand racism episode of Flight of the Conquerors. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> all you all right. riding around on your kangaroos. All right. Uh, last point. <laughs> They're all like, keep where's this, the car? <laughs> to keep this kind of on track. I know. I'm, <laughs> it hates us all. I, I know. I'm, I'm no kid. I'm trying. Sorry um, that you have to be the babysitter of do this we, podcast. Do we, oh, I'm used to it. Do we ever uh, act out scenes? Yes, I go through scenes in my head, uh, especially if there's something I'm working on, specifically like the conversation I was talking about that takes place that I took like hours to rewrite. I'm sort of rewriting all the conversations between these characters in the book. So as I'm thinking about how it's going to go, um, I play it out in my head and sort of see you know, how would they react and what would I do back and forth and um, stuff like that. I don't think he meant conversations. Uh, I don't really care. That's what I, I'm talking I, about. I think he did mean conversations. Like just, I, all right. And I don't think act out he meant say it in your head. No, I, I, I do think that's what he meant, Lovejoy. You guys are Since really... he specifically wrote or act out the scenes you write in your head before oh, you write them. Oh, you ruined this person <laughs> by person Damien Fox. Let me get this email correct. What a bummer. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, so to speak. I had, all these bri- I had all these Bridges questions to ask you. Yeah, no. Uh, anything to add before we go on to our last letter and make Kid happy by wrapping things up? Uh, I was going to say, I do a lot of my sort of hashing out scene acting in my head while I'm driving, because that's most of the time when I'm alone. Interesting. And awake. So I hear that um, just creativity-wise that like you know when when there's increased blood flow, flow to your brain you you're more creative so like that's why people get their great ideas in the shower and i'm wondering if or while like doing driving cocaine. you're like for whatever reason there's like this increased blood flow to your brain and you're getting these great ideas for sorry i'm sorry i'm waving this around like a fan and just ruining this audio quality i'm wondering if there's well, the, a, a correlation oh well, also when I drive, it's mostly to and from places that, you know, I'm either out doing errands or going back and forth to work. So you're on autopilot? Things where, like, yeah, I'm on autopilot. My okay. brain knows where I'm going, and so I have all these free cycles to think, and Super I'm by dangerous. myself. And so, I mean, I'm just sort of alone with my thoughts, and I naturally sort of go to writing. You realize that now the image of our readers have of you is Kei Mirasaki gets up and drives places alone all day. Just thinking from, about sexy things. I was going to say, like, I'm just imagining, alone. like... Then I go do errands alone. I'm just imagining, like, this otter in a scion, just, like, driving down the highway, like, head tilted back, not even looking at the road, but this, like, massive erection in front of the <laughs> steering wheel. <laughs> Any artist, feel free to draw that. You're welcome. The scion is maroon. <laughs> Kyle, please read our final email. Read it now before it's too late. Dear podcast and authors, starting with K, I feel that there are several novels lurking in the back of my head. I've tried to write one several times, but each time I was not happy with how I was writing it. Yet I haven't given up on it. I just do not think I'm ready for it as a writer, like I'm not ready for the others. Has this happened to either of you? That you have a story that eludes you, but instead of just giving up on it and going to the next, you wait until you're ready? Signed, Rashawn. Uh, yes, for stories that I can't talk about right now because I want them to be a surprise, but, uh, I have multiple larger projects that I know I want to write, but I have accepted I am not ready to write this yet either because I need to do more research before I know enough to believably write about the subject matter 
or because I just don't feel like I'm in the right headspace to write it. Uh, yeah, and I think the, the last question is kind of like, instead of just giving up on it and going to the next, you wait until you're ready. I never really give up on a story completely. I mean, I might say, well, I don't think this story's going anywhere, but even with stories like that, which I've done, I'll occasionally just be thinking about something else and I'll remember that story. I'm like, ah, oh, I wonder if I could make that work. No, still no. But it's never, I never, you know, crumple it up and throw it across the room. I mean, there are stories where I'll finish a first draft and go, eh, this isn't worth rewriting. The idea wasn't as good as I thought it was, and I really just don't feel like making it good enough, and so it's just going to sit on my hard drive. And, like, I already wrote it. I'm just like, eh, it just wasn't that great of a story, and it'll, you know, I wrote it, it's done, no one will ever see it, and there's no shame in that. Sometimes you're just like, eh, you know what, next story will be better, move on with your life. Yeah, exactly. Revel in your power as a creator to move on to the next thing. I, that said, I have a couple ideas for novels that I haven't written. I'm kind of letting them develop to see which one's going to be the next one. But um, but yeah, so I mean, yeah, it happens to us all the time. And uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Remember, we're looking for emails from our Australian listeners. Ask us about, I don't know, whether our toilet's flushed the right way up here. Or, um, it would be the wrong way. Well, it would be the wrong way for them. And... Uh, I don't know. Any other questions that come to mind? We'll do an all-Australian episode sometime in the future. Unless I, you're from Perth, because nobody from Western Australia is worth hearing from. Or Darwin. Fuck Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're from, if you're from Adelaide or Melbourne, it's cool. Sydney, Canberra, whatever. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously? <laughs> Sumi, yeah, we're doing that. That Sumi Mugu guy is going like, to kick my ass. <laughs> He's going to be like, oh. I was like, do you know somebody from Darwin, I Australia? I do know someone from Darwin. Okay. Well, yeah. nobody's going to do that tonight because... Oh, uh, it will take a while. It's going to take a while for this to be posted. I don't think he knows And I won't tell I... you when it's posted. Oh, good. Okay, I won't tell him that you have a podcast. So, there you go. All right. By Email the way, address. I heard from our... Uh, my geography professor told me that... Wow, are your tech savvy wolf is touching me. Um, <laughs> does my that. geography professor told me that um, the way that toilets flush is not based on hemispheres at all. That's actually a myth. Yeah, it's a, it's how, it's how the toilet is exactly built. how the toilet is built. Yeah, exactly. So bummer. The the, 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 <laughs> yeah, the, well. the Coriolis effect has to do with water going down a drain. And not how toilets flush. Right, because that's the, actually the, like the, a the physical... Toil the it's toilet flow is way yeah. more powerful than the Coriolis effect. So it sinks. Yeah. Okay, so tell us how your sinks flow. Right. That's what that's what we're interested in. Um, unsheathedpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can see the writings of Lovejoy Weasel at weaselwordsmith.com. Please visit. Our traffic is abysmal. <laughs> Please visit. It's 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 Lovejoy plus a small staple of diligent writers that work with him. Yes. There's some other people there. They're not very good, but I let them write for us anyway. I, I've I've contributed once or twice. Yeah, Kyle did a guest blog. It was very good. Um, Hirosaki san has never contributed for us. I have not been asked. Shall oh. should you ask? I would do be so. interesting and then contribute a blog for us. Oh. Dude, I was just talking about like otters and the scions with erections. That's interesting. <laughs> I'm not. A, I don't review furry porn. Bridges, hi. Ha <laughs> ha! Touche. <laughs> Boom. Nailed it in one. That was awesome. Anyway, um, I'm on. <laughs> we're all Fur on. Affinity Live Journal and Twitter as Cam Hirasaki. And I'm Kyle on Fur Affinity. Kyle Gold on Twitter and Live Journal. And let's love joy. Yeah, I'm on Lovejoy as Fur Affinity, but I don't know why you'd ever go there. <laughs> you're you're on Fur Affinity as Lovejoy. Yeah, that too. <laughs> also those. Also uh, Lovejoy online. Weasel on Twitter. Yes, follow Lovejoy Weasel. He's very amusing when he gets drunk. <laughs> Which is now. I'm going to go tweet. <laughs> this episode is also brought to you in part by a 2006 Dolcetto, and which by, if you don't know is a kind of red wine. And by a previous picture of margaritas. And by a pre oh, of pomegranate margaritas. <laughs> Which were delicious. How very gay. All right. Thank you all. Good night. And keep writing. <laughs>